I was finally able to make it to one of these. Excellent. So what I want to discuss tonight is uh, the enterprise antivirus assignment. But since you haven't made it to one before, um, if you have um, questions, you know, feel free uh, to bring them up right now. I had a question about the acceptable use policies document. Yep. When you wanted us to highlight the changes, did you want us to put them under the revision history 7.0? Um, no, I just wanted to see the, you know, the changes, you know, either bold, italic, or a different color, just so that they jump out at me. Uh, I you forgot know. to highlight mine. Okay. Uh, did you put them in the revision history? Yes. Okay. I'll look at the revision history. It's just a little easier for me to see what the changes are um, if they're highlighted, you know, so that they jump out right at me so that I can, uh, you know, look at that and say, oh, yeah, they had a really good reason for that or, oh, I'm not quite sure why they do that. I might want to ask. Um, so, you know, that's just, um, you know, that that's helpful for me. But, of course, you know, if it were a real policy and you were making changes, that would go into the revision history. But as initial, um, you know, if you were taking the SANS policy template and modifying it for your purposes, yeah, I'm not sure that you would need to put it specifically in the revision history if it's, you know, version one of your policy um, where you've taken the, you know, you've decided you're building a security policy and uh, you're just getting started and you know, you've taken the template and made modifications. Um, I don't know if I would put it in the revision history there since it, it's a policy that's not yet adopted. But it, it's fine. I can, I can reference the, vis the revision history and the, the um, acceptable use policy is relatively short. I won't have a chance to look at those um, for a couple of days anyway. So... I'll start sending feedback on them to people on Thursday or Friday. So, you know, there'll be some comments. If I think that it's fine, um, then I'll, I'll attach a letter grade to it. If, um, if I think there's something important that's missed, I might, you know, ask you to make some changes and resubmit it. You know, the idea behind doing policy to me you know, even though it's worth a quiz grade, because I think this is, this should be really thoughtful and it should be a fair amount of work, but it's not like an objective quiz where it's an A or an F. It's really kind of like going through proposing policy, you know, having a discussion with the stakeholders and when, what you know, when you're done, what comes out is, um, something that people have generally agreed upon, you know, in your organization so that you have uh, the different stakeholders represented. Now, of course, you're not doing this for, most of you aren't doing this for real organization. So, you know, I kind of play devil's advocate some of the time to be different stakeholders to say, what, you're putting this restriction on us? And, uh, you know, and you can always very politely reply, you know, well, I think it's really important that this restriction is there and here's why. And, uh, and I could be the uh, end user that says, okay, I get it. I don't like it, but I get it. <laughs> or, uh, or I could be, you know, pay, playing the role of the boss saying, you know, I think that there's a couple of things falling short here or this is over the top. Um, and that's a different kind of stakeholder. So, you know, if we have this good back and forth, you know, pretty much everybody's policy, if, if they follow through with the back and forth, is going to wind up with an A grade. Um, if people don't bother to do revisions when I ask them, then, you know, at some point, if I've asked for revisions, I don't get them, you know, I'll, I'll be pretty disappointed about that. And then they definitely will not be an A grade. You know, and so some people, their first time through, I'm going to look at it and say, yeah, I think that's great. Um, 
and some people I might say, did you, did you think about it from this angle and, uh, you know, think about it this way. And if, if after you've thought about it, if you still feel strongly, you know, you can, you know, you can go with it. Or I might say, you really need to change this because uh, I don't think it would work, you know, in the situation you describe. So um, it's not like an objective test quiz where, you know, the answers are right or wrong. And, and, you know, policy, you know, gets written. Some of it is clearly based on the security needs of the organization. And then some of it does reflect, you know, personal feelings about the role, uh, you know, either you as an individual or the IT staff as a group. Um, about the role of technology in your environment. And, uh, you know, some people are gonna be in an environment where they really wanna encourage exploration and the use of technology. And so certainly it takes steps to protect yourself because when people are exploring technology, they are going to make um, uninformed decisions that have unintended consequences. And so if you can try to set things up that guard against that, that's great. So I, I think, you know, I, I've said to a few people if in the K-12 scenario, um, a lot of schools will run deep freeze on their computers. And Oh, that's so you, a good one I could have mentioned. Yeah. So, you know, for example, deep freeze, you can make all kinds of changes to the desktop, you know, and to the system settings, and but they don't survive a reboot. And so if you're in an educate, you know, this is great for an educational setting, because if you're trying to teach students about how to work with a computer, just locking them out of the settings entirely doesn't really make sense. Um, but if you're in a business environment with really strict rules and, and high security needs, locking people out of areas of the desktop can make a lot of sense. So um you know it it kind of it it depends a lot on you know what the role of, is in the organization and um you know if if the if it's an internet web retailer for example but they're doing a lot with technology they may have a group of users that they really encourage um out of the box thinking and exploration, but they might not do that with all of their employees. And so then if you were doing that, you might, you know, put something into the an acceptable use policy that says, you know, all people who handle sales calls, you know, for example, they need to address sales calls and they're probably going to have a stricter desktop than, you know, some other people that might be doing R and D or something else. And so, uh, you know, you could put that into your acceptable use policy of, you know, these uh, employee groups have a little more flexibility than these employee groups because of the nature of their job. And, uh, and that way you can kind of give yourself flexibility within the policy to say um, where it says, you know, if you're part of this group, you have more restrictions. If you had part of that group, you have fewer restrictions, but it always it's going to be responsible use. So, um, you know, po policy is an interesting thing. I always caution people that, you know, the word shall gives you no flexibility. If something says shall, if there's a trigger to shall, then you have to do it. And if you don't want to paint yourself into a corner, you don't use shall, you use may. And then you list, you know, a range of options that might get triggered by may. Um, now, there are times where you, you should use shall and really mean to use shall. But, you know, if you're going to paint yourself into that corner, make sure you're really intending to paint yourself into that corner so that you don't get caught in a situation where the policy says shall and you're and you're thinking this isn't really fair 
way to deal with this with this person in these circumstances. But if the policy says shall and you don't follow it and then something else comes along and you do follow it, well, you're not applying the policy consistently and you may be opening yourself up to legal liability. So, but may allows for discretion. And it's clear, you know, when you use the word may, that there is discretion. And so, you know, somebody can say, well, so-and-so did this and they didn't, you know, get fired or whatever. And it's like, well, A, we're not talking about so-and-so. Uh, B, they didn't do, you know, to the degree or with the impunity that you did that, you know, we, we feel that how you dealt with this was so severe that it's cause for termination. There's no slap on the wrist. Um, so may is a little bit more flexible, but you know, there are some things in policy where if you really think you need to take a stand and draw a line in the sand, then do it. Um, just make sure that when you make that choice that you're going to feel good about that in whatever circumstances pop up related to that. You know, so if it's illegal activity and, you know, if you put it in your policy, anyone involved in illegal activity on company time shall be terminated. I'd be good with that. You know, um, that that's a, uh, a company can't really tolerate li illegal activity. So, you know, for uh, my school setting, I changed it to the, if, any of the employees, especially education staff, are involved with illegal activity, that would be cause for termination? Mm hmm I think that's fine. You know, and, uh, and... Then the only other thing I changed it to was that I introduced the, like, idea of one-to-one -one devices for mm -hmm. children. Mm-hmm. Because the scenario and the template said that we have a lot of money to work with, but there's also a lot of students on reduced lunches and assignments these days might require a computer yep. to do outside of class. Yeah, it's kind of interesting that schools, uh, you know, that are from poorer districts because they're eligible for a lot more grants sometimes have an easier time with a one-to-one -one initiative than a school that is relatively well-funded. There are, there are most grants that are out there for schools are tied to your count on free and reduced lunch. And uh, so, you know, I've seen, you know, I teach in a school district that, you know, is, is decently funded, and, but we're ineligible for all kinds of grants. And I used to teach in a school that was not well funded and we had a high count of free and reduced lunch and people were pulling in grants all the time uh it, it it's a it's a odd thing around uh i mean certainly you know there's you know there's reasons for that to try to introduce equity and you know school districts that you know don't have a lot of kids on free and reduced lunch very often the families can provide something um, yeah. even if the school can't. And if you have a lot of kids on free and reduced lunch, the families usually can't provide something. And so, you know, the school should. Um, so yeah, a one-to-one -one initiative, you know, that would not at all be unusual in the scenario that I gave you. Um, in fact, there's a lot of one-to-one -one initiatives going on right now. There used to be, uh, you know, the first time I heard about a one-to-one -one initiative I was still working full time in IT and it was a really big deal. I think it was Maine. They did a one to one initiative statewide and they were the first state to do it. And uh, it was, you know, probably 15, 18 years ago, something like that. And uh, Everybody in school IT was wowed by the fact that Maine took the initiative to do that. It was pretty cool. I think 15 years ago, laptops were a lot harder to come by than they are now. Yeah. Well, and you didn't have Chromebooks back then. So, you know, the, you know a lot of one-to-one -one initiatives these days use Chromebooks. 
and uh, you know back then the Chromebook didn't exist, and so it was a, a much more expensive proposition to do a one-to-one -one initiative, you know, 15, 18 years ago than it is now. It can be done relatively cheaply now, you know. Yeah, and the um, products themselves are a lot better than the ones 15 years ago. And absolutely. The cost. I still have some laptops that my dad was using in 2004, 2005 that cost about a thousand dollars, and it's just a brick. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> it's kind of funny, you know. It's amazing how quickly technology becomes obsolete, and and you know, I mean, these days, in a lot of things, there's a certain amount of planned obsolescence, but I don't, you know, they wouldn't. You know, with computers, it's just how quickly it marches forward. It's not so much that it's planned, is that, you know, that you build what you can build at the time, even though there's all of these new developments in the works, but it's not, you know, in a mass market capability. It's, uh, it's kind of a funny position to be in. You know, the, I think the hardest thing about working full time in IT is, keeping up with how quickly it changes. All right, so I wanna talk about, um, let me get this up to the proper place. I'm gonna talk about the um, enterprise uh, assignment. So I'm gonna share my screen.